From the intersection of 218 and 80, with rivers like our own that seek for seas they never find. I'm Aaron McNally, and this is Curiosity Now. Curiosity Now listeners, this is Aaron McNally, and seated next to me is David Clem, Professor Emeritus of Religious Studies at the University of Iowa, author and or co-author of many books and articles covering such diverse topics as religion, theology, philosophy, and to some extent, aesthetics, science, German idealism, Paul Ricoeur, hermeneutics. David, would you like to add anything to that bio? No, that sounds about right. <laughs> well, I'm honored to be here with you, and I thank you very much for your time. And I want to disclose to the audience that David and I don't really know each other professionally. We actually have run into one another's acquaintance through the practice of Tibetan Buddhism. We both uh, have meditated together and chanted and done other things at the Tibetan Buddhist Center Milarepa in Iowa City. We've also gone on some road trips and heard some teachers. Uh, David, I was wondering, actually, in the spirit of that, if I could start tonight's conversation off with uh, a little quip that I captured off of one of your lectures that you gave at the Milarepa Center. Folks, you can find it on YouTube. Uh, you were lecturing about Chogyang Trungpa's Lion's Roar, and this is the thing you said. At what point will my bluff be called? You'll have realized that I don't know anything, and that I have no right to be here except for the fact that I'm just like the rest of you. I got a few books and nothing else to do on Monday nights. Well, David, here we sit on a Tuesday night, and I certainly think you have quite a bit to offer. I'd like to thank you for both your friendship and your willingness to conduct this morning. Well, Aaron, evening. thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be here and uh, happy to talk with you as always. I'm always happy to be with you, and so that's great that we could do this again. Thanks so much. I'm just going to jump right into deep water. Okay. How do you feel about that? That sounds just good. plunge right into 12 That's foot, good. huh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. So um, you have thought and taught about religion <clears throat> for many years. Would you say that's accurate? That's ab absolutely right. Yes. yes. Uh, just for the purpose of conversation, do you have a quick thumbnail definition of what religion is? Mm. Well, you know, I'm, my thinking is oriented in many ways toward Paul Tillich. Uh, I don't just repeat his definition, uh, which is the simple ultimate concern is the way he defines uh, religion. It's, it's what concerns us ultimately. And um, he distinguishes ultimate concern from any provisional or uh, relative concern that, that we might have. Con ultimate concern makes any of those provisional uh, concerns or interests possible. Uh, it's also the focal point of our being and um, that on which we are centered as uh, human beings uh, to the degree to which we are centered. Uh, we have an ultimate concern. Uh, and But, you know, I, I don't use that definition precisely, uh, but I do think of uh, religion as uh, the de depth dimension of ordinary experience. In other words, uh, it's not a particular category of uh, experience. It's not like certain things are religious or certain experiences are religious and by nature and others are not. Uh, uh, religion is the depth dimension in any experience. So uh, religion is uh, the experience or the event of having um, uh, an event unfold or disclose something of deeper meaning than you had previously noticed, and that which opens up a, a place where you can uh, dwell and think and uh, find a certain presence that was um, 
maybe hitherto lacking or absent in some way or that uh, uh, takes on a sacred meaning for you. Uh, so something like that, I think, is what I conceive of as religion. That's just right in line with where I was going to go next because, you know, reading uh, a few things of yours, uh, most recently the uh, book that you co-wrote, Religion and the Human Future, I could believe that's the title of it. Yeah. Uh, you know, I. it seems to me that you think that there's something about the essential nature of human beings which would be basically lost if religion were discarded. And I guess first I'd like to ask you, do you think that's an accurate representation of your belief? And, and if it is, what is that essence of human beings that, that would be lost if, if such a thing occurred? Well, I, I'm not sure, uh, because if that uh, depth dimension or the religious uh, side of human existence were lost, uh, then you're saying that uh, we who had lost it would be lost. Uh, we would have lost something essential about ourselves, but of course we wouldn't recognize that. We wouldn't uh, be aware of, of that loss. Uh, we can't uh, feel a loss of something that we, we have never had. Uh, but yeah, I, I, most abstractly considered, there would be a a huge loss. Uh, I think the religious dimension is is the uh, meaning giving dimension of life, and uh, because of that, it makes anything else important and significant. So, um, you know, it, it is what is essential. I mean, it seems to me that essentially we are uh, pilgrims or wayfarers on a on a path, and initially we don't know even that we are on a path or that we have a, a journey to complete, much less uh, where that would lead us or how uh, how we should conduct ourselves uh, uh, while on that path most expeditiously, most productively and fruitfully. So um, it takes a long time in life just to come to the understanding that, that uh, uh, we have a task, and that, that task is bound up with spiritual meaning, and um, that can be found through any number of different avenues. Some of the more common would be literature and, and religion, or organized religion and religious practice and, and uh, art, uh, music, and so forth. Uh, they are all highly appropriate for delivering um, religious or spiritual meaning. So, um, yeah, that's the essence of who we are, it seems to me. Um, everything else has to do with our uh, physical survival, which is, which is ab absolutely important, of course. We can't minimize that, but it, it's certainly not why we are alive. You've certainly, you've just, just volleyed me right up to what I was going to ask you next, and that is, you know, there seems to be some kind of irony that when we, as you mentioned, become ignorant of our own nature, we simultaneously become ignorant of the nature of our surroundings. And the, the threat to this depth consciousness that we're experiencing is not only threatening our essential selves, but it's also threatening our environment. Would you say that's correct? Absolutely, yeah. No, I, I think there's a, a very strong correlation between um, self and world, between locating the, the center of self and, and also the meaning-giving center of the world. Uh, now, certain personality types are more oriented toward one or the other. By world, I mean that in which we live our lives and have our being. Uh, so that would include uh, the natural environment and also the, the humanly made environment uh, around us, the uh, uh, umwelt, the world around us. 
but also the social world, the others with whom we uh, share the world, um, they are part of our world as well. Uh, in fact, there's a sense in which me, I, I myself in this embodied form are, are part of the world since the, the I or spirit is not uh, uh, itself part of the world, but it, it is that which, which um, has a world or is uh, uh, placed within a world, but it, it's not identical with it. It can't be subsumed under world. I and never the world. There's always a distinction between I and world, self and world. But um, they are paired dialectical concepts. Uh, we can only become aware of one because we are also aware of the other um, and have a contrast to draw between the two of them without a sense of uh, immediate self-consciousness I could not be aware of, of the world as that in which I dwell and uh, without awareness of my worldly environment uh, I wouldn't become aware of, of the singular individual consciousness that I am. And so the, those two are um, uh, correlative and dialectically paired uh, terms, the principles of being, of all being. We're certainly of one mind. Because the question I wanted to ask you next is, you know, this, this uh, second phrase in the compound word we use to describe ourselves, human beings, what it, what is being in your estimation? Hmm. Now that's the question, isn't it? That's a wonderful question. <laughs> yeah, that is the question of philosophy. What is the meaning of being? And uh, uh, being is uh, the most fundamental, most basic of of uh, all uh, of all concepts, uh, because it is implied in any other concept. Uh, of anything that we can speak, uh, we say that it is, and uh, yet to say that it is uh, also implies some contrast uh, between its being or isness and uh, its not being, its projected possibility of not being at all, uh, its nothingness. And so, you know, being has its own dialectical opposite of prime uh, pair of terms that, that go together, being and non-being, and uh, if they're inseparable, uh, dialectically and uh, uh, systematically inseparable. Uh, so we can't think of being without also uh, thinking of non-being. Non but uh, therefore, a sense of being, we talk about the common sense or uh, uh, a sixth sense or, or something like that, with, which you might just call mind, but um, it's a sense of, of what it means to be, uh, even though we cannot conceive or uh, rationally define or cognize uh, what it means to be. There has to be some other uh, access to, to the meaning of being than, than that of uh, rational cognition. Um, because, strictly speaking, uh, being is um, undefinable. It cannot be put in the form of a concept. Uh, just because uh, any concept has to be able to uh, distinguish itself from other concepts, uh, both within its own genus, and uh, or to make contrast between its genus uh, or large class of of terms and, and other genera, um, but there's no contrast that you can draw over against being, except for that uh, mysterious factor which is part of being, and that is, is its, its own potential non-being, but um, neither being nor being non-being will um, particularize a notion. It, it, it won't convert into uh, any particular thing, any any uh, uh, anything that you can point to or uh, speak about, 
the, the about nature breaks down. Uh, we have no uh, third person perspective on being. It, it's that within which we are and or are not and uh, so it cannot be defined and, and so how in the world do we think about it? it it's the most mysterious term that there is because in one respect we all know what the meaning of being is um, you know Martin Heidegger would point out that uh, if I say the sky is blue um, you know, I recognize that uh, sky is the subject and uh, blueness is its a predicate that I attribute to, to sky. And the connection between the subject and the predicate is the copula is to be. Um, and being is the connection between uh, subject and object. It's the connection between the uh, uh, subject of a sentence and, its, and the predicate. It's the connectedness of, of all things. Um, now we know what we mean when we say the sky is blue, because, and we can contrast that with, um, say, the sentence, the sky was blue, now it's gray. Uh, and we know that that change in tense uh, in the verb to be signifies something real, even though the words sky and blue have remained the same in those two sentences. The sky is blue and the sky was blue. Um, so there's a shift there. And we have an awareness of, of the difference of meaning in those two uh, uh, temporal forms of the verb to be. Uh, you know, likewise, if, if uh, I say the sky is blue and then, then later I say uh, the sky is not blue, uh, at that point we've evoked uh, non-being or, or to be in its canceled or negated form and we know what that means too even though sky and blue as subject and predicate have remained the same so uh, we have an awareness of the meaning of being even though we cannot define it and that awareness uh, is an awareness of the connectability of those uh, two terms subject and object and uh, subject and predicate and the connectability of the, or the interconnectedness of all things. That, that's the best I can do in terms of telling what, what um, being is. But you see, that, that turns the term interconnectability or interconnectedness into a symbol because uh, it's not a formal concept. It doesn't denote anything that, to which we can point. It is merely pointing out or suggesting something that we have to um, have an intuition of, some type of uh, uh, an intellectual intuition, a feeling and um, uh, imagination of. Uh, we, have, we form an image and we have a feeling and we have a quasi-thought, but that's as close as you can get, I think, to the, to the meaning of being. But we can feel it. I just can't express my jubilance at, at, at the degree to which our thoughts are interconnected, S symbolic though that word may be, and I'm leaning into with these designations you've just proposed, uh, this concept of, uh, in parentheses, A, theism. This whole discussion of being a theism it tends to benefit this. You know, there's been this cultural habit towards a theism, and it tends to benefit from ignoring any kind of intellectual definition of, or description of, or imagination of, or visualization of, or proposition of. God, right? It, it, a theism it, it marginalizes these things as either apologia or academic curiosities. But it seems to me that the population, the general population, 
tends to continue with a more or less paternalistic deity concept, despite all of these uh, resentments by certain people. And I just wonder, uh, you've done so much work reading and interpreting both sacred texts and modern commentaries. What do you think is the importance of trans and post theisms? And uh, what important aspects of the idea of God do we miss or misinterpret if we're not thinking about those things? Mm. Both, both. Uh, I should I should add to that. What are the a theists missing, and what are the common populists missing as well? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a very deep question, isn't it? It's a, that's a good question. Uh, the term God is um, correlative as well and paired with the term being. God and being are paired terms, it seems to me, in, in Western thought. And uh, if uh, being refers to the open background of the interconnectedness of all things, uh, which constitutes them in their being. Uh, God is a term that, that refers to the self-manifestation or self-proclamation uh, of that, that open background, that interconnectedness, the totality, the, the um, sum of things. So, uh, but not the sum. I don't mean that as if it were a, 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 an arithmetic sum, but rather the the wholeness of things. Now, um, so that gives the term God a symbolic quality. It, it appears to us. It uh, grasps us. It um, announces itself to us. Uh, in other words, there's a, uh, an element of, of disclosure uh, that attends to the word God uh, relative to being. Being is not so much... Uh, a notion that is, that is uh, revealed to us as it is uh, discovered at the limits of thinking and um, it opens up into uh, an unlimited and uh, uh, wholly universalized uh, notion and uh, so whereas uh, being is a, the, a product of active thinking as it reaches its limit uh, and feeling and, and intuition, uh, God is is uh, <clears throat> a product of of uh, the wholeness of being acting upon us. Um, and so, then, how do those two things you know relate? And and how do you uh, connect uh, atheism or post theism uh, to to those? terms, or even, you know, what do we mean by theism? Well, uh, in Western theology, you know, God and being have always been paired in correlative terms, whether you accept that um, correlation and, and uh, think that with a formula like that of in the Middle Ages, uh, where Thomas would say that by... Um, reason alone, human beings can, can determine that God is. And even some of the abstract uh, or theoretical properties or qualities of, of Godhead. But um, by reason alone, humans cannot know, for example, what God intends uh, for this world or for uh, human beings. Uh, that plan is not uh, given to natural reason. It has to be revealed if it's going to be uh, known at all. And so that's the Middle Ages. In other words, faith and reason in the Middle Ages would be uh, compatible with one another. They cannot contradict each other because truth is one and both God and being are truth, but they're just different um, uh, manifestations or, or uh, uh, attitudes toward uh, 
the one truth that is uh, uh, differently signified by each of those terms, God and, and being. Uh, but in the Reformation period, I mean, thinkers like Martin Luther um, would drive as hard a wedge between God and being as possible and, and think that, um, you know, metaphysics is a Babylonian captivity of theology and, and that our thinking about God is uh, perverted when it um, is structured by um, metaphysical discourse. Uh, so within the body of theology, you have uh, different attitudes about the, how the terms God and being relate to one another. And uh, I want to make that clear. And, and so you know that I'm not just talking out of uh, one possible way of uh, relating them, but I'm thinking about their relatability and the fact that uh, they are intrinsically connected one with the other. Now. Um, it seems to me when we think God, using you know modern ontological concepts, uh, then you know we think of God as uh, that means to think God in terms of being. We think of God as ground of being and non-being. Um, God is not any particular being. God is not a being. Uh, if so. God would not be God. God cannot be uh, a being and still be that than which none greater can conceive can be conceived. Uh, that was Saint Anselm's mm -hmm. formula for or definition of the being of God: that than which none greater can be conceived. But um, any particular being uh, cannot be that than which none greater can be conceived, because we can conceive something greater, and that would be being itself. Now, being itself includes both being itself and non-being. Um, so, God is being itself, meaning the ground of being and non-being. That which makes any being that is possible, and also that which makes the demise or the negation of any being that is uh, possible. So, if we think of God as ground of being, uh, we are prohibited from thinking literally that God is a paternal figure in in, uh, in the heavens, uh, because that would turn God into a being. Uh, and we can already establish that God is not a being, but being itself. Uh, now, that theistic conversion of the concept of being into a being is, it seems to me, um, unwittingly to the theologians who used it, um, is actually a form of idolatry because it, it, it turns the unknowable and uh, permanent mystery of God into uh, something particular. Uh, that can be described, and, and then we think of preferential actions. God acts this way and not that way, or God wants this and not that, or God approves of these people and not those people. And all of that uh, nonsense uh, enters uh, into theological thinking only because a fundamental mistake has been made, uh, which is to convert the ground of being and non-being into a being, namely highest being or the supreme being. And then we think of that supreme being, the God who is over all uh, as a patriarchal figure in, in heaven. Now, but the, the key point is that that notion, that theistic idea of God uh, doesn't hold up any longer uh, just simply because it is, has been subjected to criticism that has rightfully uh, displaced it, and it should not uh, be the idea of God because it, it uh, uh, is unable to withstand uh, honest critique. Um, so, you know, theism is a term that now designates a historical period in, in Western theological thought. I know there are still theists, and there are very likely most people are theists. 
but that doesn't mean that theologically they are uh, correct uh, any more than you know people who are still living in a Newtonian universe and have have no inkling into quantum physics uh, have a correct image of the physical nature of the universe. Uh, these things take time uh, to catch up uh, with thinking. Um, maybe it, they'll never, people will never catch up. I, I don't know, but uh, theological thinking has transcended theism, rightfully so. So um, post-theism is simply the kind of theological inquiry that that uh, begins from the death of that God concept, uh, the death of the theistic God. Um, if we have the funeral for that God concept, then how do we think of God? Um, one has to start from the beginning and, and uh, think about how we understand the, the being of God in uh, the terms of our own experience, and uh, and then that would be a, an opening ploy for post-theistic uh, theology. Now, if we think of uh, religion as the depth dimension of experience, then experience always involves a subject in relation to an object, and the depth dimension therefore would be the you know the deep relation that makes possible that. It's the subject relating it to the object, and vice versa, self and world uh, relating to uh, one another, then uh, one way of, of thinking about God in a post-theistic uh, framework would be uh, to, to think that we can model whatever aspect of, of being or nature that we wish to. This is the basic method of modern science. Uh, modern science will start with, with uh, observations of regularities. We observe things happen with some kind of regularity. And then uh, you make a, a model, or we might have called that a hypothesis or, uh, in some earlier time. Um, so you try to model what that regularity is. And then um, the model is uh, tested for its truth, and that means uh, we devise ways of determining whether the model is accurately reflecting uh, the being that is under study or not. And uh, the assumption is that models are, are finite and uh, only have capture partially the truth of things. Uh, so they can always be improved, and they are always open to critique. Uh, they models welcome their own critique, um, and so if if we model nature, uh, and you know we critique prior models on the basis of re new revised models that are able to explain more than the previous model did, and they retain the successful features of an earlier model while negating the the features that that um, you know fail properly to uh, to reflect being, then um, you have a history of a series of uh, models of nature uh, or of our human experience, um, you know, we, which are they say the term is asymptotically that you know are gradually more and more uh, trying to reach a a uh, you know, a condition of, of truth, knowing all, all along that there is no such thing as a perfect consonance between the human mind and the, the truth of being. But hopefully you are approaching that increasingly as a limit concept. Now, um, if you think that way, then models, because they have a subject-object structure, uh, you know, which mirrors the subject-object structure of, of our experience of things, um, then they, models also have a depth. There has to be a um, fundamental principle that is the, uh, the ground of the relation between the subject and object when we construct a model. 
And that ground or uh, depth dimension, that, that ultimate principle of the, of the model, uh, would be considered the manifestation of God within the context or the terms of, of that modeling uh, activity. So uh, in that sense, you could make a model, for example, of a work of art or of a literary production or of a, a atomic structure, whatever you want to look at. And uh, then under an analysis and interpretation, uh, attempt to articulate the depth or ultimate principle of that model uh, to see the manifestation of God in terms of that model. Then back up another full step and you try to conceive of the depth that appears in all models. Uh, in other words, the one depth that is continually reoccurring uh, with every attempt that you make to, to grasp the, the depth in particular models. And that, it seems to me, is at least one possible uh, way of, of doing something like post-theistic theology. Another way would be instead of uh, working with uh, analytical thought on, in, in such a way that is um, that makes analytical thought equally compatible with art and science. Um, you could instead take a standpoint of just uh, symbolic presentations um, and, and work with dream imagery or uh, fantasy or uh, any production of the imagination that, that you care to look at, mythology and, and so forth. And um, develop a theological hermeneutics, um, working out principles of interpreting uh, the depth dimension as it appears in different symbols. But, but in both cases, you see, you're looking to um, work beyond the particularities of, of any set of symbols on one hand or set of models on the other hand uh, to try to disclose or to um, approach in your thinking the, the depth that is uh, appearing in many or all of these different models or symbol systems. Um, because God cannot be uh, equal to or identical to um, any particular system that frames it or any symbol that frames it. Uh, rather, what is being framed in the nature of the case, uh, transcends, it breaks out of um, any interpretive grid or uh, interpretive framework that we apply to it in order to, to try to make it uh, clear and uh, comprehensible by the, the human mind. So we have to acknowledge that the, the ultimate transcendence of God or of being and um, realize then that, that uh, theology in the nature of the case is um, pluralistic and uh, is diverse as, as the human mind is uh, vast. Well, it seems to me that we run into the same problem with how we cognize ourselves. Uh, when we subjugate the ground of being to a concept of a being, we are uh, somehow limiting our conception of ourselves to some sort of singular um, enterprise that doesn't justly represent the, the diversity of, of mind that unfolds itself in experience. That's a really very good point, Aaron. I, I think you're absolutely right about that. I mean, uh, the same dynamic that is uh, taking place in terms of our conception of God, uh, when we uh, misconstrue ground of being and, and take it to be highest being, or and then symbolize that as paternalistic father in heaven. Um, likewise, when if we take ourselves in in terms that 
are narrowed to a you know a one particular um, access or or a reflection on a ground of being, whether it's ground of our own being or ground of being itself. Um, we misconstrue ourselves. We we deny ourselves possibilities that are uh, intrinsically open to us, and uh, it, you know if we're interested in the human spirit, then uh, it just seems to me that those those boundaries would fall away, and we'd we'd be interested in uh, all of the material that commends itself to us for. Uh, you know, this type of spiritual or, or theological reflection. Uh, you know, I, I think that that's really the case. We should be immersing ourselves in, in the studies of mythology and uh, uh, archetypal art and, um, you know, great literature. I, I think that we should do that just as much as immerse ourselves in, uh, uh, you know, scientific and anthropological and other uh, theories while acknowledging the, the methodological difference between you know some of those different disciplines uh, a difference which is too often forgotten uh, in other words with the modern scientific disciplines we adopt a position of, of uh, over against of the subject standing over against an object which can be uh, defined and uh, comprehended and ultimately controlled uh, when we apply our science uh, in a practical sphere and it becomes technology uh, then then the aim is control of being but um, in, in the science, rather, excuse me, in the arts or in, in spirituality and religion, that uh, third person over against quality of the subject being over against an object um, does not hold up. It's, it's, uh, it disappears. It, uh, the subject is now involved with or has some type of intrinsic belongingness to uh, that which it is studying. Uh, so when I study art or literature or uh, religion, you know, ultimately I'm studying some potentiality, some possibility of, of my own uh, of my own human being. And uh, by exploring the meanings that are given in these different expressions, I explore uh, hitherto on, known aspects of, of my own possibility of my own being um, so there's no third person perspective to be taken on this matters of the spirit uh, but that's not an irremedial gulf between uh, science and art uh, modeling I think is a task that uh, bridges them. It's a methodological approach that can uh, be common to both, uh, even though the models uh, look slightly different one from the other in each of the two cases. In the, in the case of modeling literature or art, you have to include the viewer, the observer, um, mm -hmm. in the model. Mm -hmm. uh, and even in modern science, though, that, that uh, exigency is becoming more and more acknowledge that the observer uh, is really part of the phenomenon being observed. Mm -hmm. That certainly is the case in quantum mechanics. David, I've just got one final short question for you based on all of this. In such a context as we've stumbled upon during this conversation, is there really such a noteworthy distinction between prayer and meditation? Hmm. Well, I, yes and no. There is and there isn't. I mean, it all depends about how we think about both prayer and meditation. There are many forms of prayer. There are many forms of meditation. We tend to think of prayer in terms of prayers of petition. Mm -hmm. You know, dear God, please, if you'll just uh, 
to save me from this terrible fate. I promise I'll go to church every Sunday from the rest of my life. <laughs> but seeing as we've established the, the 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 problems with such a way of thinking about the notion of God. Yeah. So that's that's right. So that you know, different forms of prayer, contemplative prayer, uh, centering prayer, uh, and the like. Prayer, which is is simply a, um, the self's attempt to become more aware and to be uh, uh, in the presence of Godhead or deity or the sacred. Uh, now that certainly is not different from meditation in any kind of noteworthy way. Mm -hmm. Meditation is, is in, in a certain sense, that type of prayer, or you could say prayer is a certain type of meditation. I mean, in each case, uh, what's crucial is the mind. Uh, you know, what, what is so astounding uh, and gripping about Buddhism, to me at least, is that... Uh, uh, the Buddhists go right to the heart of the matter, which is that uh, there's something that's not right with our mind. Uh, our mind is um, typically out of control. We, we uh, have thoughts that are just wayward entities. They will jump all over the place. As if we take a moment to just... Uh, be quiet and, and uh, contemplate what's happening with our own mind, uh, we'll see this uh, hubbub of uncontrolled chaotic activity. And there's something wrong with that when we uh, are just by habitual uh, slovenliness or uh, neglect. Uh, so incapable of finding centeredness and, and uh, depth within our own mind. Uh, turn that noise off. Uh, control what we're thinking and not thinking. Uh, not by trying to impose a rule on don't think this or do think that, but by just letting your mind be what it is and, and observing it. Um, observing it as, as connected to you, but not defining you, uh, letting thoughts rise and letting them pass and not being attached to them. Uh, don't follow them or uh, grasp at them or uh, pursue them. Just uh, take note that they are there and watch them pass by like clouds overhead in the sky. And uh, uh, they're interesting. Take take interest. There's nothing wrong with that, but there's a difference between taking interest and clinging or pursuing. Um, don't let them hook you. Uh, don't follow the thoughts down some path that uh, unbeknownst to you, so you're, you're not mindful as you are uh, you're following your own thoughts. It takes a long time to quiet the mind and a lot of practice. And the Buddhists know that, and um, that's where they start, and that's the middle, and that's the end. I mean, is working with mind. Uh, I, I think that that's precisely what uh, we need to do today in this world, with things so confusing and so um, chaotic and, and unbalanced. Uh, we have to find that balance in our own minds, or we won't find it at all. Very wise words for our curiosity now. Audience, David, I thank you very, very much for your time. I appreciate you. Well, thanks. Kind and thank wise you, words. Aaron. I hope it was worthwhile. Oh, it was most certainly so. Thanks.